Now open your question paper and look at part one. You will hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. Reading your book about your career exploits, I have to say it does sound to me as if you've done what a lot of kids dream of and managed to make a living out of. Let's face it, larks, high spirits. <laughs> it's akin to having the nerve to go to a company and ask for a million pounds to go on holiday. It's been wonderful. Long before this, you started as a photographer. Yes, I've always liked imagery. Um, that's part of the reason why I got involved in all these dreams, as you call them, of adventure. It's pure theatre, really. And you did a spell in advertising, I read. Yes, I did. And it was at that time in 1975 when I had my first balloon flight. And in those days, they really were the stuff of dreams. And uh, it occurred to me that there must be a possibility to do something here with these huge billboards in the sky and to uh, make a living out of it. Reading your book about your career exploits, I have to say it does sound to me as if you've done what a lot of kids dream of and managed to make a living out of. Let's face it, larks, high spirits. <laughs> it's akin to having the nerve to go to a company and ask for a million pounds to go on holiday. It's been wonderful. Long before this, you started as a photographer. Yes, I've always liked imagery. Um, that's part of the reason why I got involved in all these dreams, as you call them, of adventure. It's pure theatre, really. And you did a spell in advertising, I read. Yes, I did. And it was at that time in 1975 when I had my first balloon flight. And in those days, they really were the stuff of dreams. And uh, it occurred to me that there must be a possibility to do something here with these huge billboards in the sky and to uh, make a living out of it. Extract 2 Robin Adams, you've recently published a book of photographs of famous women with the proceeds going to a number of charities. How did you decide who to photograph? Are they people you had an interest in already because they're very high profile? Or did you think, there's a hook there and I'm actually interested in photographing this person? Well, although they are all, as you say, high profile women, we went about this in a low-key way. I'd heard of most of them, or at least their reputations, and had seen their various media images. There's always more to people than meets the eye, or the camera lens, and it was that something I wanted to expose. But this proved more of a thorny issue than I'd expected. Oh, really? I thought it would have been easier. They would have known exactly how to present themselves. They've done it so many times before. Mm, well, in my work, I get behind the veneer of the face. The women feel secure enough to open up about themselves, and I have to be careful not to betray too much of that. Robin Adams, you've recently published a book of photographs of famous women with the proceeds going to a number of charities. How did you decide who to photograph? Are they people you had an interest in already because they're very high profile? Or did you think, there's a hook there and I'm actually interested in photographing this person? Well, although they are all, as you say, high profile women, we went about this in a low-key way. I'd heard of most of them, or at least their reputations, and had seen their various media images. There's always more to people than meets the eye or the camera lens, and it was that something I wanted to expose. But this proved more of a thorny issue than I'd expected. Oh, really? 
I thought it would have been easier. They would have known exactly how to present themselves. They've done it so many times before. Mm, well, in my work, I get behind the veneer of the face. The women feel secure enough to open up about themselves, and I have to be careful not to betray too much of that. Extract 3 I'm ringing about Stoke City football team. I've been a supporter of theirs for years. You'll have noticed in Saturday's match just how much we miss Steve Harris. We lack the power up front since he's gone. There were some nice touches from Evans, but the real strength that Harris represented, that served as well over the years, was just missing on Saturday. It was a gaping hole in Stoke's attack, and I'm sure the manager's regretting selling him. I mean, we don't need the £11 million that Barcelona paid us. We need our goal scorer back. If you speak to the Stoke fans, most of them will say no amount of training will produce another Harris. He provided the punch and that just wasn't there on Saturday. No wonder we lost. Still, for a good 30 minutes, our lads dominated the field. They showed some spirit, I must say. They haven't thrown in the towel yet, so... Provided we get a good replacement for Harris, and the manager had better get it right this time, maybe there'll be light at the end of the tunnel after all. I'm ringing about Stoke City football team. I've been a supporter of theirs for years. You'll have noticed in Saturday's match just how much we miss Steve Harris. We lack the power up front since he's gone. There were some nice touches from Evans, but the real strength that Harris represented, that served as well over the years, was just missing on Saturday. It was a gaping hole in Stoke's attack, and I'm sure the manager's regretting selling him. I mean, we don't need the £11 million that Barcelona paid us. We need our goal scorer back. If you speak to the Stoke fans, most of them will say no amount of training will produce another Harris. He provided the punch, and that just wasn't there on Saturday. No wonder we lost. Still, for a good 30 minutes, our lads dominated the field. They showed some spirit, I must say. They haven't thrown in the towel yet, so... Provided we get a good replacement for Harris, and the manager had better get it right this time, maybe there'll be light at the end of the tunnel after all. That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You will hear a short talk about a bird of prey called the kestrel. For questions 7 to 15, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at part 2. Today, we're very pleased to welcome Sean Pierce from the British Nature Trust, who is going to talk about one of the most beautiful birds to be seen in Britain, the kestrel. Uh, Sean. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Um, I'm here to launch the Trust's publicity campaign. Uh, recent relatively small-scale research we've carried out is indicating a significant decline in kestrel numbers and... Um, oh, Basically, we're asking the public to help us get our statistics even more accurate. But first, let me give you a few facts on the bird to help in sighting, and a little background information, and an explanation of the cause of some of its problems. <clears throat> the kestrel. Its unusual name comes from the old French for a rattle, 
And that refers not to the fluttering wing movement, but to its cry. <laughs> and this is very distinctive. It has the capacity to hang in the air for long periods, with its wings vibrating so rapidly you can hardly see the movement. Uh, this is a picture of a mature male hovering. Yeah. Notice its beautiful plumage in different shades of brown and cream, and its easily recognised fluted tail. Uh, the picture's reproduced for you in the survey material to help in identification. Now, before the diversification of their habitat in the last hundred years or so, kestrels were solely to be found nesting on cliff faces, and their main prey was the vole. Um, a small uh, mouse-like creature in the countryside, but which now will be unfamiliar to many of you. But now, kestrels are increasingly making their home in towns, where they're not an uncommon sight these days. You know, they settle on the window sills of houses, uh, skyscrapers, etc. Now, uh, turning to food in this new habitat, they depend not on their rural staple of voles, who don't appear to do very well in this setting, but on whichever small rodents they can find and these are to be found in abundance. Kestrels have also found a viable habitat in upland areas, mainly the preserve of sheep farming, which is proving to be a problem, as we shall see. Kestrels have actually been known to be highly successful in keeping up their numbers over the years because of their notable ability to quickly repopulate. Um, how this works is simple. They aren't dependent on one locale and can gradually move to where the habitat is more favourable. Uh, but, but this is only effective when problems affect a small area. Difficulties at a macro level are now beginning to affect them. For example, upland kestrels suffer due to increasing sheep densities. Their grazing decreases the vegetation, which provides cover for the main upland kestrel food, the vole which of course in turn means a large population of the birds of prey cannot be maintained. Now these problems have been compounded by long periods of heavy precipitation, uh, mainly rain, but also snow, which causes nesting difficulties. Now, let's have a look at some of the population statistics. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are thought to be in the region of 50,000 breeding pairs. That's 100,000 adults left in the UK, which means with an average of three offspring per pair, circa 250,000 birds. But kestrels have a relatively low survival rate when young, which helps cushion extremes in population. Uh, well, a built-in control, if you like. Only a proportion survive, many succumbing in infancy because of their parents' deliberate neglect. Now, because of the changes mentioned earlier, the population is falling further and will soon, we believe, not be able to recover. Something must be done, and that's where the public come in. What we ask of you is to take two or three of these sighting forms. I'll pass some out in a moment, but I'll also leave a pile at the back, which you can fill in when you have a sighting. They ask for information about numbers, timing, and, crucially, location. Uh, there is a picture, as promised, and simple diagrammatic information to help you establish whether what you've seen is really a kestrel and not confuse it with, for example, a peregrine falcon. Well, um, thank you very much indeed for your time and attention. Um, I hope you'll be able to help us. Now you'll hear part two again. Today, we're very pleased to welcome Sean Pierce from the British Nature Trust, who is going to talk about one of the most beautiful birds to be seen in Britain, the kestrel. Uh, Sean. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Um, I'm here to launch the Trust's publicity campaign. Uh, recent relatively small-scale research we've carried out is indicating a significant decline in kestrel numbers and, um, basically, we're asking the public to help us get our statistics even more accurate. But first, let me give you a few facts on the bird to help in sighting and a little background information and an explanation of the cause of uh, some of its problems. <clears throat> the kestrel. Its unusual name comes from the old French for a rattle. And that refers not to the fluttering wing movement,
but to its cry. <laughs> and this is very distinctive. It has the capacity to hang in the air for long periods with its wings vibrating so rapidly you can hardly see the movement. Uh, this is a picture of a mature male hovering. Yeah? Notice its beautiful plumage in different shades of brown and cream and its easily recognised fluted tail. Uh, the picture's reproduced for you in the survey material to help in identification. Now, before the diversification of their habitat in the last hundred years or so, kestrels were solely to be found nesting on cliff faces, and their main prey was the vole, um, a small uh, mouse-like creature in the countryside, but which now will be unfamiliar to many of you. But now, kestrels are increasingly making their home in towns, where they're not an uncommon sight these days. You know, they settle on the window sills of houses, uh, skyscrapers, etc. Now, turning to food in this new habitat, they depend not on their rural staple of voles, who don't appear to do very well in this setting, but on whichever small rodents they can find, and these are to be found in abundance. Kestrels have also found a viable habitat in upland areas, mainly the preserve of sheep farming, which is proving to be a problem, as we shall see. Kestrels have actually been known to be highly successful in keeping up their numbers over the years because of their notable ability to quickly repopulate. Um, how this works is simple. They aren't dependent on one locale and can gradually move to where the habitat is more favourable. Uh, but, but this is only effective when problems affect a small area. Difficulties at a macro level are now beginning to affect them. For example, upland kestrels suffer due to increasing sheep densities. Their grazing decreases the vegetation, which provides cover for the main upland kestrel food, the vole, which of course, in turn, means a large population of the birds of prey cannot be maintained. Now, these problems have been compounded by long periods of heavy precipitation, uh, mainly rain, but also snow, which causes nesting difficulties. Now, let's have a look at some of the population statistics. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are thought to be in the region of 50,000 breeding pairs. That's 100,000 adults left in the UK, which means with an average of three offspring per pair, circa 250,000 birds. But kestrels have a relatively low survival rate when young, which helps cushion extremes in population. Uh, well, a built-in control, if you like. Only a proportion survive, many succumbing in infancy because of their parents' deliberate neglect. Now, because of the changes mentioned earlier, the population is falling further and will soon, we believe, not be able to recover. Something must be done, and that's where the public come in. What we ask of you is to take two or three of these sighting forms. I'll pass some out in a moment, but I'll also leave a pile at the back, which you can fill in when you have a sighting. They ask for information about numbers, timing and, crucially, location. Uh, there is a picture, as promised, and simple diagrammatic information to help you establish whether what you've seen is really a kestrel and not confuse it with, for example, a peregrine falcon. Well, um, thank you very much indeed for your time and attention. Um, I hope you'll be able to help us. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You will hear the historian, George Davis, talking about society and the theatre in England in the time of William Shakespeare. For questions 16 to 20, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best, according to what you hear. You now have one minute in which to look at part three.
We welcome today Professor George Davis from the University of Wales. Professor Davis is an expert on society in 16th century England, the time of Queen Elizabeth I and, of course, Shakespeare. So how would you categorise society at that time, Professor? Well, it was certainly a society undergoing dramatic changes in which there was an explosion of interest in the language, even though the printed word hadn't become universally available. We don't quite know exactly how many people could read and write, but literacy would not have extended to all levels of society. Some historians call it an illiterate society, but that seems rather pejorative. No, the best way of putting it, in my view, is to refer to it as a pre-literate society like most societies that have ever been on the planet. In fact, our society, in which we tend to expect everybody to be literate, is the one which is out of step. So how did this pre-literacy affect ability to communicate at that time? What it meant was that the prime form of communication was direct speech, face-to-face, -face, which means communication involving the body, the stance, the distance between people. It also meant that people were much more finely tuned to the spoken word, they could take in more of it, they could listen in a more acute way. It's therefore quite natural that the art form which corresponds to that particular situation should be drama. One thing that has always puzzled me is where did the actors in the 16th century learn their craft? Were there any drama schools then? Well, Shakespeare's actors, the boys and the older men in his company, didn't actually have any acting training before they joined his company. You see... In Shakespeare's day, you learnt your schoolwork by repeating it out loud all day long. The arts of oratory and rhetoric were part of your normal education, and they were also the means by which you learned. So they had wonderful voice training, which enabled them to develop an individual style. I've always thought of the Elizabethan society as one that revelled in its voice, that at its heart delighted in giving voice to words. Mm. Would that be correct? I would certainly think that the atmosphere in the average theatre of the time would surprise us today. I believe it would sound and feel more like a present-day football ground. <laughs> in a modern theatre, there's a sort of reverential hush as the darkness descends and we feel you know, that we're in some sort of temple devoted to the worship of great art. But um, then the atmosphere would have been much noisier. Remember, Shakespeare and his contemporaries had theatres which were open to the sky, and so the noise of the city, the shouts of the street sellers, the neighing of horses and so forth, would add to and mix with the sounds of the stage, and indeed, in my view, would comment on them. So, in the same way, this was not a world for the shy or the softly spoken. <laughs> not at all. Now, people's voices in the 16th century, it seems to me, wouldn't have been geared to the exchange of intimate revelations about the self. This is a notion of speaking that's a 20th century concept, as is our notion that a play should give you the intimate, personal feelings of the author or of a character on the stage. Then, art was largely about external issues how a country should be governed, how one should deal with rebellion, questions of that order. Fascinating, Professor. I'd like at this point to bring in another speaker who is going to tell us about Elizabethan court life and how Shakespeare... Now you hear part three again. We welcome today Professor George Davis from the University of Wales. Professor Davis is an expert on society in 16th century England, the time of Queen Elizabeth I and, of course, Shakespeare. So how would you categorise society at that time, Professor? Well, it was certainly a society undergoing dramatic changes in which there was an explosion of interest in the language, even though the printed word hadn't become universally available. We don't quite know exactly how many people could read and write, but literacy would not have extended to all levels of society. Some historians call it an illiterate society, but that seems rather pejorative. No, the best way of putting it, in my view, is to refer to it as a pre-literate society, like most societies that have ever been on the planet. In fact, our society, in which we tend to expect everybody to be literate, is the one which is out of step. So how did this pre-literacy affect ability to communicate at that time? What it meant was that the prime form of communication was direct speech, face-to-face, -face, which means communication involving the body, the stance, the distance between people. It also meant that people were much more finely tuned to the spoken word. 
they could take in more of it, they could listen in a more acute way. It's therefore quite natural that the art form which corresponds to that particular situation should be drama. One thing that has always puzzled me is where did the actors in the 16th century learn their craft? Were there any drama schools then? Well, Shakespeare's actors, the boys and the older men in his company, didn't actually have any acting training before they joined his company. You see, in Shakespeare's day, you learnt your schoolwork by repeating it out loud all day long. The arts of oratory and rhetoric were part of your normal education, and they were also the means by which you learned. So they had wonderful voice training, which enabled them to develop an individual style. I've always thought of the Elizabethan society as one that revelled in its voice, that at its heart delighted in giving voice to words.、Mm. Would that be correct? I would certainly think that the atmosphere in the average theatre of the time would surprise us today. I believe it would sound and feel more like a present-day football ground. <laughs> in a modern theatre, there's a sort of reverential hush as the darkness descends, and we feel. You know that we're in some sort of temple devoted to the worship of great art, but、um, then the atmosphere would have been much noisier. Remember, Shakespeare and his contemporaries had theatres which were open to the sky, and so the noise of the city, the shouts of the street sellers, the neighing of horses, and so forth, would add to and mix with the sounds of the stage, and indeed, in my view, would comment on them. So, in the same way, this was not a world for the shy or the softly spoken. <laughs> not at all. Now, people's voices in the 16th century, it seems to me, wouldn't have been geared to the exchange of intimate revelations about the self. This is a notion of speaking that's a 20th century concept, as is our notion that a play should give you the intimate, personal feelings of the author or of a character on the stage. Then, art was largely about external issues. How a country should be governed, how one should deal with rebellion, questions of that order. Fascinating, Professor. I'd like at this point to bring in another speaker who is going to tell us about Elizabethan court life and how Shakespeare. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four consists of two tasks. You will hear five people talking about travel experiences they have had. Look at task one. For questions twenty-one to twenty-five, choose from the list A to H each speaker's reason for choosing the travel experience. Now look at task two. For questions twenty-six to thirty. Choose from the list A to H how each speaker feels about their travel experience. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have forty-five seconds in which to look at part four. Speaker one. I have to admit that an African safari wasn't exactly top of my list in terms of a new and exciting travel experience, but a few years ago, we were lucky enough to come into some money, so that widened our horizons quite considerably. Everyone seemed keen on the idea, so I set about organising it. The trouble is, I'm not really that fond of animals. So I was still having second thoughts when we arrived at our destination. Still, despite the misgivings, I managed to summon up some enthusiasm for our first game drive. But to be honest, nothing could have prepared me for my own reactions. The sheer beauty of the place, and seeing animals in their natural habitat, was absolutely awesome. And everyone in our group seemed to share my opinion. 
Speaker two. I'm a bit of a fanatic when it comes to trekking in the mountains, and I'd read an article about what a doddle climbing Mount Kilimanjaro was, and I decided to give it a go. Everything went swimmingly the first few days. The pace was bearable, and the views were stunning. We made quite good progress, and I was feeling pretty chuffed with myself until we attempted the ascent on the summit. What no one had bothered to explain was the fact that at those altitudes the thin air can be really problematic. I started to feel really sick and disorientated, and I could hardly walk. Don't get me wrong; about half of us did, in fact, manage to drag ourselves to the top. But there's no way I'd take anything like that on again in a hurry. Speaker three. Actually, how I ended up being a crew member on a tall ship, I'll never know. I'm not the best of sailors, even on a calm sea. So I think it must have been one of those times when you just throw caution to the wind and do something reckless just to prove to yourself you're capable of it. Um, I can't, in truth, say that it was the most enjoyable experience I've ever had in my life. And there were one or two pretty scary moments too. I can tell you, especially when it was stormy and the sea seemed to be higher than the mass of the ship. So, what did I get out of it? You might ask. Well, probably the fact that it made me realise that if you really put your mind to something, you do find the hidden energy and、uh, determination to cope with it. Speaker four. Most people seem to have a pretty romantic idea about the Scottish Highlands, and there's no doubt you'll find some of the most beautiful and remote places in the UK there. That's why people come from far and wide to visit the place. So, being me, I had to find out if they lived up to their and my expectations. <laughs> well, I certainly wasn't disappointed by the scenery. Anything but. No, the downside was that I went there in July. In other words, the start of the midge season. Up to early June, things are fine, more or less. But come the summer, these little black flies are everywhere. And if you're camping, as we were, you can say goodbye to a good night's sleep. Speaker five. I'd never really thought of Cuba as a tourist destination, until one evening a friend pointed out that the best time to visit it was now, before it lost its old world charm and changed forever. So that was that. On reflection, I suppose the beaches we went to there do look pretty much like those anywhere else, but. You soon realise that Cuba isn't just a carbon copy of umpteen other places, and it certainly hasn't lost its culture. There really is something quite unique and irresistible about the place, and the easy-going attitude and charm of the people who live there. Now you will hear part four again. Go on. I have to admit that an African safari wasn't exactly top of my list in terms of a new and exciting travel experience, but a few years ago, we were lucky enough to come into some money, so that widened our horizons quite considerably. Everyone seemed keen on the idea, so I set about organising it. The trouble is, I'm not really that fond of animals, so I was still having second thoughts when we arrived at our destination. Still. Despite the misgivings, I managed to summon up some enthusiasm for our first game drive. But to be honest, nothing could have prepared me for my own reactions. The sheer beauty of the place, and seeing animals in their natural habitat, was absolutely awesome. And everyone in our group seemed to share my opinion. Speaker two. I'm a bit of a fanatic when it comes to trekking in the mountains, and I'd read an article about what a doddle climbing Mount Kilimanjaro was, and I decided to give it a go. Everything went swimmingly 
The first few days, the pace was bearable and the views were stunning. We made quite good progress and I was feeling pretty chuffed with myself until we attempted the ascent on the summit. What no one had bothered to explain was the fact that at those altitudes the thin air can be really problematic. I started to feel really sick and disorientated and I could hardly walk. Don't get me wrong, about half of us did in fact manage to drag ourselves to the top, but there's no way I'd take anything like that on again in a hurry. Speaker 3 Actually, how I ended up being a crew member on a tall ship, I'll never know. I'm not the best of sailors, even on a calm sea, so I think it must have been one of those times when you just throw caution to the wind and do something reckless just to prove to yourself you're capable of it. Um, I can't in truth say that it was the most enjoyable experience I've ever had in my life, and there were one or two pretty scary moments too, I can tell you, especially when it was stormy and the sea seemed to be higher than the mass of the ship. So, what did I get out of it, you might ask? Well, probably the fact that it made me realise that if you really put your mind to something, you do find the hidden energy and uh, determination to cope with it. Speaker 4 Most people seem to have a pretty romantic idea about the Scottish Highlands and there's no doubt you'll find some of the most beautiful and remote places in the UK there. That's why people come from far and wide to visit the place. So, being me, I had to find out if they lived up to their and my expectations. <laughs> well, I certainly wasn't disappointed by the scenery. Anything but. No, the downside was that I went there in July. In other words, the start of the midge season. Up to early June, things are fine, more or less. But come the summer, these little black flies are everywhere. And if you're camping, as we were, you can say goodbye to a good night's sleep. Speaker 5 I'd never really thought of Cuba as a tourist destination until one evening a friend pointed out that the best time to visit it was now, before it lost its old world charm and changed forever. So that was that. On reflection, I suppose the beaches we went to there do look pretty much like those anywhere else. But you soon realise that Cuba isn't just a carbon copy of umpteen other places, and it certainly hasn't lost its culture. There really is something quite unique and irresistible about the place, and the easy-going attitude and charm of the people who live there. That is the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I shall remind you when there is one minute left, so that you are sure to finish in time. <laughs>